Saturday Morning Physics is sponsored by the M. Lewis Tiffany Endowment, the Hideko Tomazawa Endowment, the Physics Department, and by gifts from friends of the program. I've retired three times, and, uh, and I'd like to uh, say that the unemployment situation is not my fault, because <laughs> each time uh, there's been somebody that took over the job. Uh, anyway, uh, one good thing about being retired is that uh, you're free to do, uh, I hope, important things, and also to say things that other people may feel more constrained to say about saying. So I'd like to talk today about um, climate change and uh, possible uh, approaches to uh, tackle the problem of uh, uh, replacing fossil fuels. So the uh, official uh, subject matter is uh, solar, wind, biofuel, and nuclear, sort of the big four uh, that's uh, <clears throat> bandied as possible uh, big contributors in this fight. And uh, to do a realistic assessment, I hope, from a physics point of view, of uh, each one of these in terms of how much we can get, how soon we might be able to expect uh, big returns, and how expensive it will be. So the outline of the presentation is our first uh, review, the basics of climate change. I'm sure no one here needs convincing that climate change is uh, coming, and in fact, in some sense, is already here. And uh, to convince you that uh, there are only really, I think, five low carbon technologies that can give us, let's say, more than 10% of the total energy need that we uh, project <clears throat> by mid-century. The first is to continue what we're doing, but uh, capture the carbon dioxide emission. So that's called carbon capture and sequestration. Uh, the downside is it's expensive and it's not easy. Then there's biofuel, which is land intensive, but it's uh, the only one that one can say is absolutely necessary. And it's necessary because although you can think about electrifying personal transportation, you can hardly imagine flying an airplane with batteries or <laughs> driving. I don't think you would like to fly one <laughs> in one. <laughs> Uh, or, you know, uh, any kind of heavy transport, ships, big trucks. Uh, it's just not practical. So we're going to need uh, liquid fuels for those, and uh, if we don't burn uh, oil-derived uh, fuels, we're going to have to develop biofuels at scale. Then there's solar photovoltaics and solar thermal. And uh, as an astronomer, if we could do this cheaply and solve the problems, I would be for it. Okay, but unfortunately, it's very expensive and not likely to get much cheaper for reasons I'll discuss. Then there's wind, which is uh, moderately expensive, not too expensive, but its big problem is it's uh, erratic. You can't count on it. You can't, uh, <clears throat> it's not base load, is the uh, jargon. There's nuclear. And uh, uh, there's, of course, safety issues, but in my mind, actually, the biggest issue about nuclear is if you want a sustainable nuclear uh, solution, you need uh, reprocessing and breeding. And these are controversial things that I'll explain if you haven't heard about them before. I'll talk about a transformative technology, which is molten salt reactors. All right? And I'll uh, review why I think, uh, and many people think, that this is an uh, option that uh, um, was unfortunately not pursued and that we should uh, really have a, another look at this. And finally, I'll, I'll talk about nuclear power to help make biofuels. So <clears throat> I'd like to start with a quote from uh, John Maynard Keynes, uh, <clears throat> uh, who basically said, I don't know if he actually said this, but certainly he's written many articles that has this sentiment. And that is for thousands of years, for millennia, until the Industrial Revolution, the only way humans made economic progress was to enslave other peoples. So I'd like to begin this just to remind people 
that although we think fossil fuels are not good, they have changed tremendously, very barbaric behaviors, and that if we don't perform the transformation well, we will go back to those kind of barbaric ways of trying to better our situation. So here's a plot. Everybody knows that the Industrial Revolution started in Britain. Of uh, per capita income in 1990 dollars as a function of time going back 2,000 years, all right? So you can see that for most of history, people lived um, a few hundred dollars a year, so roughly a dollar, two dollars a day, until the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, uh, which you can sort of date as to when people started burning coal, and in particular invented the steam engine to pump out the water from coal mines that up to then was taken out by children. That's one form of slavery, or women, <coughs> to help their men uh, dig out the coal. And from there, we see this rapid rise in per capita income. Till today, in Great Britain, it's about $20,000 per person. Okay? <coughs> and so that's what fossil fuels has given us. First coal, and then burning uh, oil, and most recently, rapid expansion in natural gas. <coughs> it has a side effect that everybody knows. That is, if we release carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And if we plot the amount of carbon dioxide in the Earth's atmosphere as a function of time, now this goes back 10,000 years, okay? <coughs> we see that throughout <coughs> uh, human uh, history, civilization, maybe starting around here, until pre-industrial times, the carbon dioxide has never surpassed about 280 parts per million. And then starting about 200 years ago, it has been rising rapidly. All right? <clears throat> until today, it is at 392 parts per million. Now, carbon dioxide is known to be a greenhouse gas. What does greenhouse gas mean? Some people don't believe this, but it's actually very simple. And that is that the atmosphere of the Earth contains gases which acts like a blanket. And that blanket keeps the surface of the Earth warmer than higher up. The sunlight comes down, warms the surface of the Earth. It's transparent to the sunlight. But when it goes back up, it's infrared radiation. And that radiation is not transparent. It has to work its way out, just like heat. When you sleep under a blanket, it has to work out. It's not that you're putting out more heat, but you get warmer because it's harder to push out the heat that you do have when you're under the blanket. And that blanket, we know, is there. If you go up to the mountain, it's colder than at, at sea level. And if you go up higher, it's colder outside the airplane. How much colder? Well, you know, average temperature on Earth is about 60 degrees Fahrenheit. And if you go up to a high mountain, there's snow, so it's below 32 degrees. If you go up in an airplane, you know, it's often sub-zero. So it's obvious that the greenhouse effect is responsible for about 60 degrees Fahrenheit. And we know that carbon dioxide is about 27% of that, or about 16 degrees. Most of it is due to water vapor. But there's nothing we can do about water vapor because the air or the atmosphere is open to the ocean. So water goes up, it comes down, we can't control it, okay? But carbon dioxide we can do something about. <clears throat> so 16 degrees. So if it was 16 degrees at 280 parts per million, and today it's 392 parts per million, it's a simple calculation. It's not very, <clears throat> it's not very precise, but it's approximately correct that it's 16 degrees Fahrenheit at 280, then it will be 22 degrees Fahrenheit, or that we should have produced a six degree rise in the temperature because of our human activity. And the controversy comes because we've only seen one degree, or maybe 1.6 degrees. And the reason for that is because we're not yet in radiative equilibrium. The sunlight comes down, it goes up. In radiative equilibrium, you would radiate as much at the top as sunlight puts in. Then you're in equilibrium. <clears throat> but we're not in equilibrium, and the reason is shown by the 
of this uh, experiment that I hope Monica will help uh, us uh, perform. So, <clears throat> so here is this, uh, you may have seen in the news that uh, Rich Muller at Berkeley, who uh, didn't believe the climate data, uh, has re-performed his own, his team has re-performed analysis, and they see this temperature rise over the last uh, 100 or more years, and it's about 1.6 degrees Fahrenheit, not six. And you can see all the controversy is because it's not easy to see a one degree rise or thereabouts, all right? <clears throat> the reason it's not six degrees is because we have a buffer, all right? That buffer is ice. And so in some sense, we are living on borrowed time by melting ice, all right? It was when I realized that this was what was going on that I decided I had to change fields. I had to retire one more time and try to help uh, do something about this, okay? <clears throat> so basically, if you have uh, <clears throat> Monica setting up two beakers of water, and uh, one of them is going, she's gonna put ice in, and uh, we're gonna heat up these two beakers of water, one without ice, one with ice. She's also gonna put some carbon dioxide into uh, the two beakers. And that's because uh, although we're putting up, let's say, uh, uh, a ton of CO2, uh, each of us, uh, every, I forget what it is, um, not that ton, that whole ton of CO2 doesn't stay in the atmosphere, only 40%. 60% of it is actually dissolved in the oceans, all right? So the ocean is in some sense like carbonated water. So we're gonna look at what happens both in terms of the temperature rise when you have ice and when you don't, and what happens to the carbon dioxide. Right? So <clears throat> what's gonna happen, we'll see, is that the ice, as long as there's ice, the heat that you put in doesn't go to raising the temperature, at least not much. But when the ice is gone, the temperature rises very quickly. That's the situation we're in now. The temperature is not rising that fast because we have melting polar ice. When that ice is gone, it's going to go up fast. Although we have been sliding along at hundreds of kinds of years time scale, when that ice is gone in 20 years or so, it's going to go up really fast. You're gonna see six degrees, you're gonna see eight degrees, depending on how much carbon dioxide we have to, in this blanket. So when you see these pictures, of the polar bear watching the ice disappear. It's not a polar bear you're looking at. It's us, it's all of us. We're all on this planet where we're living on borrowed time by melting polar ice. So she's going to uh, show this plot. What has happened in these two plots uh, in uh, previous experiments is that you see uh, the uh, temperature go down as she adds the ice and then it will uh, stay at a plateau, all right, where it's roughly constant. But as the ice disappears, you'll see that the temperature rises very quickly with time. In the other <coughs> uh, part of the experiment, you'll see carbon dioxide coming out of these two beakers, one which is heated, one which is ice, and you'll see that as long as there's ice, carbon dioxide doesn't come out. But in the other beaker, which is not heated, you'll actually see uh, the carbon dioxide coming out as bubbles in the uh, red fluid to make it more visible. So think about that. It's carbon dioxide that causes the problem. It's not only what's in the atmosphere. When the oceans start to warm up, the carbon dioxide will come out of the oceans, and the oceans hold more carbon dioxide than the atmosphere. It's not only the ones that we've put in, which are acidifying the oceans, which is why the coral reefs are dying all over the world. It is the part that's been stored down there basically because it's cold, okay? You don't even need this experiment. If you've ever drank a Coke, you know this is true, right? As long as there's ice, it's cold. When the ice is gone, you know, it gets warm very fast and the fizz goes out. But we'll see this quantitatively in this experiment. So I'll just go on. As 
But you just watch. This is, this is living on borrowed time. OK, <clears throat> so how much energy uh, do we need uh, to uh, replace uh, that we're currently getting mostly by carbon, uh, burning carbon-based fuels? And this plot, which was done in 2003 by the International Energy Association that uh, supports uh, uh, the uh, G8 countries, uh, you see that in 1983, we burned roughly uh, put out this much carbon dioxide. That scale isn't really important. It's directly proportional to the amount of energy we use uh, pra for all practical purposes. And the projection is that with population growth and expansion of uh, uh, developing countries, that this will rise and double uh, in mid-century. Right? <clears throat> and the hope is that although our energy needs will double, we can somehow have the amount of emission. In fact, people are now talking about dropping this down to 20% of uh, <clears throat> today. So how can we do that? How can we double the energy and have the carbon dioxide output or even more? And the answer that's given here, or the hope that's expressed, is that most of this, 75%, 80%, will come from efficiency. What does that mean, efficiency? Does it mean just building refri better refrigerators? Refrigerators are about as efficient as they can be. Does it mean industry gets a lot more efficient? Are you, do you think that industry is not efficient? Of course they're being efficient. It's costing them money not to be efficient. So the amount of savings from that sort of thing, although very desirable, we should do it, you know, is not large. Maybe 20%. It's not 80%. The rest of it, is projected on carbon capture and sequestration. If you read this report, you'll find that all our hopes are pinned down carbon capture and sequestration. So what is that? OK, so here, uh, let's see if we can follow. OK, so you can see that once uh, the one with the ice is uh, down here, you see the temperature is holding pretty steady, all right? Because there's still ice in that beaker. But watch what happens when the ice is gone. Meanwhile, the other one's starting to shoot up, right? Because there's no ice in it. OK, so carbon capture and sequestration is uh, that we do business as usual. But before we release the carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, we try to clean up the back end of this process. So for example, if we burn coal, we uh, somehow capture the carbon dioxide, because when you burn it with air, most of the gas is actually nitrogen, not carbon dioxide. You don't want to be burying a lot of nitrogen. So you capture the carbon dioxide and you try to sequester it. So you pump it into the ground, let's say into depleted oil wells or coal mines, or into geological formations. Now here's the problems with it. First, this costs money. At a minimum, it's going to cost 30% more, <coughs> or it might even double the uh, cost right, of generating electricity. Moreover, anyone who's taken freshman physics or freshman chemistry knows that there's not enough, there can't be enough room in depleted oil wells or coal mines because this is stuff that you took out as a liquid or as a solid. If you pump it back as a gas, there's obviously not enough room, no matter, you know, unless you make it enormously high pressures. A gas occupies much more volume than a. <coughs> Liquid. So there can't possibly be enough room. These are proven uh, repositories. So you have to pump it into geological formations that you don't know if you pumped it down, it could really keep it there. All right? So that's a problem. <coughs> Moreover, <coughs> there are lots of existing plants that we have already built, spent trillions of dollars building, which are not necessarily at the appropriate sites to do this. So you have to transport it large distances, <clears throat> that's expensive. Carbon dioxide, if there's water vapor, will form carbonic acid, so it's corrosive. So it's not clear as, that this is really going to really provide uh, what people are pinning all their hopes on. All right? so we should, in some sense, well, we have to do it, but to say we can do it at the scale that we need to, I think is 
probably wishful thinking. It's useful in any case only for stationary power generation. You can't possibly imagine hooking up something like this to the tailpipe of your car to uh, resolve the carbon dioxide emission. So anyway, if you do that, you can get all the other things that we want. This is the difficult part. So <clears throat> here's another thing. You clean up the front end. You know, <clears throat> uh, once you've burned it, it's kind of very difficult to capture that gas. So cleaning up the front end means making the fuels themselves carbon neutral, <clears throat> or at least less carbon positive. So how much fuel can we make, let's say, from growing plants and making biofuel? Well, basically, it doesn't matter what the technology is. Nobody's making energy by <laughs> the plant is making the energy. So <clears throat> all these different technologies, you're basically counting on the plant. So how much sunlight is there? OK, well, this is the only equation I have. <clears throat> this is something that an astronomer knows very well. Uh, this, all the sunlight, of course, comes from the sun. So we take the luminosity of the sun. We spread it out over a sphere that has the uh, a distance, uh, the radius is the distance of the Earth from the sun. We divide it by the area of that sphere, and we multiply it by the cross-section or area of the Earth. So the sunlight goes out in all directions. The Earth captures some fraction of it, which is proportional to its radius as its cross-sectional area. That's what hits the top of the atmosphere. But only 70% of it comes down to the ground. 30% gets reflected from clouds, or when it hits the ground, is reflected by ice. Okay? So only 70%. And then only 30% of that is uh, land, continents. So when it hits the oceans, you know, <coughs> well, you can't harvest it. So if you multiply all these numbers out, it's 37,000, uh, 3,700 terawatts. And basically, we need uh, <coughs> 30 terawatts. So it sounds like, you know, this is great, all right? We have plenty of sunlight. Or another way of saying this, if we divide by the area of uh, all the land on Earth, it's about 23 watts per foot squared. And you can see that that's reasonable, right? If I have a foot square, how bright is it during the daytime? Well, it's more than, you know, if I put a 25 watt bulb, incandescent bulb, and shine it. But at night, it's <laughs> much darker than that, right? So if you average, it's about 23 watts per foot square. So you don't have to be an astronomer to know that. So how efficient is a plant like corn? We have lots of corn in the Midwest. <clears throat> well, producing ethanol from corn, the net efficiency is that the corn and the ears convert sunlight into energy, chemical energy, at about 0.1%. So you've got to take three zeros out. You're left with 37 terawatts. I said, we need 30 terawatts. So that's less than 37. That's good news. The bad news is not much less. If you wanted to use corn ethanol to provide the world's needs, you would need 80% of the world's land area. There's no way that we're going to devote 80% of the world's land area, average over latitude, uh, night and day and seasons, to growing corn for this purpose. Okay? So that's out. So <clears throat> you can say, well, you know, why not use a whole plant? The corn, you know, it's just up here. If we can somehow use the whole plant, that's called cellulosic ethanol, we'll be much better off. Well, not much better off, because corn is an amazing plant. It spends about half its energy just to produce those kernels of corn. <laughs> All right, the other half, so you can double this if you use the whole plant. You can go to non-food crops. Let's not compete with food. Use bamboo, fastest growing plant in the world, OK? It's about twice as good, so you get two factors of two. And if you don't try to get all 30 terawatts, but just enough for heavy transportation, that's three terawatts. So you have one factor of 10 and then a factor of four. So you can provide all the heavy transportation with 2% of the land, if you could really do. So that's conceivable, all right? And in some sense, as I said, necessary. But that's really doing it well. 2% of the land is not much. Urban area of, that we use for cities 
in, is about 3%. So we did need to devote a pl amount of land to this purpose comparable to what we currently devote to building cities out. Well, <clears throat> better, at least uh, <clears throat> in terms of efficiency, is to directly convert sunlight to electricity. So that's what solar voltaics means. Photo means, of course, light, and voltaics means electricity. So that, here's a, a sports stadium in Taiwan. Com this roof is completely covered with solar panels. All right. <clears throat> so let's start over again. Solar energy on land is 37 100 terawatts, average over latitude, day and night and season. The efficiency of the best solar cells is much better than plants. It's about 20%. So we take 0 0.2 times 3,700, we get 7,400 terawatts electric. Now, all the other units were thermal. Electricity is about twice as good as thermal, as a rule of thumb. So we only need 15 terawatts instead of 30 if we uh, have electricity. <clears throat> that means you only need about 0.2% of the 7,400 to get 30 terawatt, uh, 15 terawatts. So that means it's only 1 15th urban area. So our rooftops enough? Well, if you go on a plane, you take a picture of a typical picture, it's not quite enough. You probably need some other things. For example, you can have windows partially transparent. So that's a great solution, right? We don't need to build these huge solar farms. We just put them on the rooftops of buildings, etc. Land area is not the problem. The big problem is cost, OK? So let me just do the calculation for you. I think it's important to do these calculations for yourself to see when you're somebody trying to pull wool over your eyes, all right? A lot of people like solar. I love solar but I think it has a big problem. Suppose we talk about one foot square of solar panel. So that one foot square is going to capture, on average, right, over seasons, over day and night, <coughs> of 23 uh, watts at 0.2 efficiency. That gives you 4.6 watts of electric. That solar panel, you go even at subsidized costs. China is basically subsidizing solar panels now, it's going to cost you $100 for that square foot. It will last 20 years. Other plants last 40 years. So you can need two of these. So you have $200 for this. Okay. So how much to produce the same amount of electricity does it cost for a coal-fired power plant? It costs you about $16 to build that, power, that part of the power plant that produces this 4.6. And then 40-year supply of coal Coal is cheap in the United States, it's six and a half cents a, a kilogram, about three cents a pound. Okay? It's dirt cheap. What can you buy for three cents a day? You can buy a pound of coal. Okay? And it will last you 40 years at $35. So it's $51. So this is a big problem, right? It costs you 200 for solar, and if you burn coal, it's $51. Now you say, well, we can afford to pay it, can we? Energy is about 10% of GDP. So about roughly, if you count everything, what you use directly, what you buy, uses, it costs you about 10% of your salary for energy. If that cost goes up by a factor of five, right, it's 50% of your salary. Are you willing to do that? Give 50% to the utilities, the other 50% to the tax man? <laughs> I don't think so. Only at small scale is this possible. When you have to do it large scale, it becomes impossible. Countries are going broke because of this. Okay? Natural gas is amazingly cheap. You can build a plant for about a third of a coal-fired power plant, $6. 40 years of fuel at current price is $37, so it's $43. So it's five times cheaper. That's why everybody's building natural gas plants, not putting up lots of solar panels. Nuclear power is even cheaper. It's most up front, $28, but the fuel is almost for free. Okay, it's $4, so it's $32. But nuclear has its own problems. On top of this, solar photovoltaics is intermittent. What do we mean by that? We mean, what do you do at night? <laughs> Are you not going to use electricity at night? 
You want to use electricity at night. Electricity cannot be stored. When you generate it, you better use it. Or you can store it in batteries, but then it's going to cost you more money. Okay, so this is the problem. Okay, this is, we have to face this problem and not just, you know, say, oh, prices are going to go down. We've been at it for 40 years. The prices have not gone down much. And for fundamental reasons, I can answer if there are questions. So what about wind? Well, we can think about wind in the following way. Why do we have wind? We have wind because we have uneven solar heating. So imagine the sun's over here, okay? The sun heats the equator more than it does the poles because it comes directly over here. Here it comes in, in a glancing angle. So the, it's hotter at the equator than the poles. Hot air wants to rise, it wants to flow over to the poles. But the Earth is spinning. Because it's spinning, and if you get closer to the axis of rotation, it's just like an ice skater. When she twirls and she puts her hands up closer to her body, the axis of rotation, she spins up. So will the air, all right? So it will go faster as it tries to rise toward the poles. As it sinks and comes back to the equator, it will go slower relative to the Earth. We're fixed on the solid Earth, so we see wind, because the wind sometimes goes faster in the direction of rotation at high altitudes near the equator and goes slower. Now, over here, because it can't go all the way to the pole, it doesn't do it in one big cell. It actually does it in three cells. And over here, the ground level actually <coughs> is opposite, so it blows from uh, west to east. Anybody who lives on the west coast knows the winds mostly comes from o over the ocean, where it's cold, and therefore we have fog on the west coast. Okay, and then when you come to Michigan, it's still blowing out this way. So that's why we have wind. So once you realize that this is why we have wind, from a physics point of view, it's just this heat engine. The Earth <coughs> is like a heat engine. And from the second law of thermodynamics, somebody named Carnot showed that the maximum efficiency, if you have a heat engine where you put in heat, at the lower levels at some up ground temperature, and you radiate it from the top at some <coughs> effective temperature, T sub E, then the maximum efficiency is the difference of those two temperatures divided by the high temperature. So the difference of those two temperatures is 60 degrees Fahrenheit. Zero is not absolute zero. In Fahrenheit, you have to add 460 <coughs> to the upper temperature, 60, to get absolute temperature. So 60 over 520, that's 11.5%. That sounds pretty good. 11.5% of 3,700 terawatts is 4,270 terawatts. Wow, that's a lot bigger than 30 terawatts. But the kinetic energy of this motion is spread out over the whole height of the Earth's atmosphere. These rising things, how high is this? That's cloud tops. All right? If you've ever been in a plane, you know that it's turbulent when you're below the cloud tops. Once you get above the cloud tops, it's no longer turbulent because it's no longer rising up and down. That's five miles up. So that energy is spread over five miles of atmosphere, and it gives you an average speed of about 60, 56 miles per hour, okay, if it's renewed every 24 hours. You know flying to the west coast takes you longer because you're in a, a headwind at that kind of speed and flying here, it's uh, faster. So we can't build turbines that have that spread. How high do we build turbines? Well, people are talking about building turbines where the wind diameter, the turbine blade, is about a tenth of a mile, 528 feet, 60 stories high. You have these big things, okay? And they capture the wind over that diameter. So that's a tenth of a mile over five miles so that's one, <coughs> two percent of this figure. That's 85.5 terawatts. That still sounds pretty good. But, and lots of people think we can get up to this. This is the maximum you can get if it's a perfect engine. Now, it's not a perfect engine. What's one of the problems? One of the problems, the wind is a lot slower than 56 miles per hour at the ground where these turbines are. It's got to move at the same speed as the ground, right on the ground. You know, if you have even a tenth of a mile, 60 stories up, it's not blowing at 56 miles per hour. 
at a good site, the wind speed might be 15 miles per hour. How fast is 15 miles per hour? Well, you know, if you can run the mile in four minutes, very few people do, that's 15 miles per hour. That's a pretty hefty wind. Okay. So kinetic energy goes as a square, so it's 15 compared to the hash, 56 squared. So you're reduced by that factor, you now get six terawatts, well below 30. Moreover, that six terawatts cannot all be converted to electricity. Why not? Because if you try to capture all of it, your wind blades is basically a plague. The wind doesn't, just goes around you. You can't make use of it. If you let it all through, you also get zero, right? You let it all through. So it's obvious that you can't have the wind blades cover the whole area. You can capture maybe 50% of it. That's problem. That's indeed true. Okay. So the conversion efficiency is about 50%. That's three terawatts electric. That's about 20% of what we need. It's not everything. Despite all the things that you may even read in Scientific American, it's simply not true. If it were true, these guys should win 10 Nobel Prizes because they have violated the second law of thermodynamics. <laughs> okay? Here's another problem. High wind, you all know, we now understand, requires changes of temperature. Change of tem changes of temperature, give changes of pressure, that gives you wind. The best is at night when it gets cold. You have descending currents, right? That brings the wind down to the ground. So the wind blows hard as at night. But you don't need electricity at night, you're asleep. So it comes at the wrong time. So you have to store it. That makes it hard. Also, if you have long extended periods of the same temperature during the day, you also don't get wind. When it's hot, and it's really hot, you need air conditioning, there's no wind. When it's cold, it's really cold, you need the heat, there's no wind. That's the problem with wind. It's cheap, it's there, but it's not easy to use. We have to be aware of this, okay? You can't just say, oh, well, you know, it has this capacity. Most of the time, it's actually not very useful. Now, there's a very simple reason for the economics why all these things can't compete with burning things. <clears throat> so the way we generate electricity, apart from photovoltaics, it's all the same. Basically, we are heating, it's just like the Earth. We heat something with some fuel, let's say with a steam turbine. The heat can come from nuclear power, can come from burning coal, or <coughs> burning oil, burning natural gas. And then you heat water, it becomes steam. The steam occupies more volume than the water, so it starts to move fast. And it flows past some turbine blades. It turns the turbine, this turns uh, coils of wire past a magnet, that by Faraday's law generates electricity. You can do the same thing with natural gas, it's even better, it's simpler, it's less complicated. Because it's already a gas, you take air in, you burn natural gas, it expands past the turbine and it generates electricity. <coughs> That's all it is, okay? Now, this can come in with wind, but you can imagine. The wind that's created naturally produces a flow of air that's much slower than a turbine. You can imagine when you use flying an airplane, those are turbines driving that airplane. That flow of air created by the burning, you know, that's 1,000 <laughs> miles per hour, perhaps, okay? You're not talking about that. That's why these things are huge, okay? So gas turbines will be cheaper than steam turbines. Moreover, the gas that you get from a natural gas, you can use to heat water, so you can have a combined cycle. That makes them more efficient, 60% instead of, let's say, 45% or 33% in the case of nuclear. Now, <coughs> this is why hydropower is cheap, because water is much, less, much denser than air, so if you have falling water, it can turn the turbine and uh, much greater efficiency, <coughs> and it's cheap. Hydro is cheapest form of power. But if you want wind, you see you have these huge turbine blades, 60 stories high, to turn something this big. That's the only way we make it to work. So it's not going to be easy to make these things cheaper, no matter what people tell you. They've been at it 
the record shows it's not easy for very fundamental physics reasons. Okay. So and then we see it in the results. You know, if we look at the share of energy generation by different technology, oil, coal, and gas accounts for over 80% of the energy. In this thing, which I've taken from the renewable uh, panel of the International Panel for Climate Change, uh, they plot nuclear at 2%. Now, that's not fair, because that's electricity. All these other things are thermal. We have to put in the same units. I said the electric power is only about 35% uh, efficient, but if the thermal power you count, it's almost 6%. So it's 6%. That's really how we should compare it. So renewables don't look bad. It's 12.9%, almost 13%. So when people hear this, they think it's wind and solar, is it? Let's see this breakdown. 6.3% of that 12.9% come from burning wood. In other words, although the Industrial Revolution has come to large parts of the world, there are 2 billion people in the world that live on less than $2 a day. The only way they have of making energy is to burn wood. Okay? Now. <clears throat> Biofuels have come up. So corn ethanol plus Brazilian sugarcane ethanol accounts for 4.2% of that. Hydro, that damming rivers, gives us 2.3% electricity, but they cheated hydro too. You have to uh, multiply this. Uh, say, if you did the same thing by burning coal or something, what is it? 6% thermal. Wind, 0.2%, but let's say you have to do it by coal. It's 0.5 percent. It has this problem, unlike these, that steady when you want it. <laughs> it's intermittent. Geothermal is 0.1 percent. People are seriously talking about drilling deep into the earth to tap the earth as heat. That's a lot harder than digging up coal. You have to drill 10 kilometers deep to get to the heat of the earth. You're not going to get very much that way. Iceland is different. The heat is close to the surface, all right? And so Iceland gets lots of heat this way, but you know, it's not going to provide large stores. Solar thermal, where you don't use solar cells, but you just let it heat water and then let that water turn into steam to drive to do electricity is 0.1%. So after 40 years, after the first oil crisis, so 38 years, wind and solar accounts for less than 1% of the total. What makes us confident that in the next 40 years, this can supply 100%? I'm not confident. All right. And if you are, then you have a lot of faith in uh, these technologies having huge advances. So I think realistically, we're going to have to somehow find other ways to do it. If we can do it with wind and solar, I'm all for it. It was a noble experiment, but we have arrived at a point which I think is close to Einstein's definition of insanity, which is you do the same thing over and over again, expecting a different result the next time. We have done this experiment in California. We have done this experiment in Europe. If we think that this is the answer, my personal view, you know, we're bordering on insane behavior. How can a nuclear fission reactor turn atoms into electricity? What exactly do solar panels do at night? And what about Naomi? For the answers to these and many other questions, tune in next week for the conclusion on Saturday Morning Physics. Saturday Morning Physics is sponsored by the M. Lewis Tiffany Endowment, the Hideko Tomazawa Endowment, the Physics Department, 
and buy gifts from friends of the program.